My name is Laura Horton. I actually have a dementia and I'm chronic prostate cancer part in organizing this seminar um, from the University of Delhi. But today we, we have a talk uh, from Chad Tay, Yildiz, and he will be talking about, um, about deep generative second order ODEs with Bayesian neural networks, and he's doing his PhD here at Aalto University. But, but please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Um, hello, my name is Chata Yildiz. I'm a PhD uh, with Pari Lattes Maki here at Alto uh, in Computational Systems Biology Research Group. Today I'll talk about our recent newest paper, uh, ODE 2 ae and it's a joint work with Marcus Heinonen and um, Harry. So here's the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll first uh, motivate the problem in a historical context. Uh, I'll then make a gentle mathematical introduction to ordinary differential equations and then describe NPOD, non-parametric ODs, which was our first work in this line of research. And then I'll describe the building blocks of OD to VAE, uh, illustrate the model, and uh, briefly go over the experiments. So mechanistic modeling uh, relies on generation, uh, generating novel hypotheses for the causal mechanisms of some observed phenomena. Uh, and it's typical, well, it, well uh, Mechanistic models have been heavily used in, in systems biology, and the way that it's done is usually like some researchers come up with a set of equations that explain certain phenomena, and then um, some experimental data is collected to validate the hypotheses to test whether they're correct or not. And all these are uh, also uh, mechanistic models, and they've been heavily used in like many research areas for, for well, over 50 years, I would say. Uh, Here's a simple example from one of um, Harry's papers from five years ago. That's, that's about uh, T cell differentiation. Uh, a naive CD4 plus T cell can differentiate into five, uh, four, different T, uh, four different types of T cells, and T helper 17 is one of those. And the differentiation process is governed by a set of cytokines as well as transcription factors, and this network of interaction is uh, what scientists believe like explains um, the cell differentiation process. Um, yeah. And the first step is to come up with some hypothesis, and the second step is to collect data. And here is, uh, well, a set of data sequences, essentially, like data comes in sequences here. Each circle is uh, the measurement of one transcription factor, uh, and this type of data is used to validate the hypothesis. Then the hypothesis look like this essentially a bunch of uh, differential equations in the setting. Um, each equation tells uh, like how the concentration of a certain molecule changes as a function of the others. So again, this is one set of hypotheses, and well, you can come up with your own set of hypotheses with different, essentially, right-hand side functions. Um, so now the thing is that for each different hypothesis, well, for each different hypothesis in each different problem, you need to come up with different right-hand sides. Uh, with, with different uh, equations, essentially. And again, then, for each hypothesis, you need to run the inference engine and then compute some sort of likelihood value or, or, or some p-value to test your hypothesis. And these are really uh, the bottlenecks in the research, and these are really time-consuming parts. So the idea of non-parametric ODs or black box ODs was born exactly at this point. So can we skip this step of writing down right-hand sides and can we use, for example, a function approximator here F? Uh, it, it could be a GP Gaussian process, or it could be just a neural network that essentially takes um, some input, which is, well, typically the concentration of the molecules at this time, and returns us how they, they are going to change uh, over time. So that was uh, the original idea. And such model is not immediately interpretable, but then um, any continuous time model, any continuous time data set, should in theory be able to, like, like this model should be able to model any source of continuous time, di uh, continuous time data. Uh, now let's talk a bit uh, more mathematical. Um, I'll describe the uh, first order ODs in a few slides, and my running example is going to be Lotka Volterra system. So Lotka Volterra is a, sec uh, is a first order OD system with two state variables. It's a it has a parametric form. Um, now, on the top figure, I'll show you the first state against the second state, and 
uh, on the bottom we'll see both states evolution over time. And here the red, red circles denote the initial values. These are essentially x0 uh, in, in, in 2D. Now the next thing that I introduce is the vector field or the differential function. It's essentially a function that takes the current state as input and then outputs the time derivative. Um, again, the function is from R2 to R2. And here I visualize the vector field of Lotka Volterra. Essentially, each arrow shows the value of the differential function uh, computed at the arrow's, uh, computed at the arrow's location. Um, yeah. And then this is what the integration looks like. Essentially, as we integrate the system, uh, we see that the circle or the trajectory follows uh, the vector field, and also we see the state evolution over time. And well, yeah, essentially all these uh, look like this. Um, and that's the picture when we integrate the system up to time seven. Uh, and lot cobalter is typically used for prey predator type of relationships. And as you can see here, when one state increases, the other decreases, and the other way around. Uh, so these are like all these are pretty useful stuff. And the integration is almost always done uh, numerically, so closed form solutions for, for state variables uh, is usually not available. And we typically use either uh, adaptive step size solvers like Dopi5 or uh, fixed step size solvers like Runga Gutta uh, for the integration. And both methods are implemented in PyTorch, in TensorFlow, in NumPy, in, and MATLAB, and many other environments. So what we proposed two years ago was essentially this. We said that instead of uh, writing out right-hand side, uh, right side, let's completely try to skip this step, and then let's have a GP prior over the unknown vector field function. So here, these set of equations, again, not necessarily correct, uh, but there are some hypotheses. And by having a GP prior over the function f, we essentially have a, a prior over the hypothesis. And that's great because given some data, we can compute the posterior estimates. And well, because I assume many people here are like most of you are Bayesian and we have GPs and well, that's great. And now here I show you four different samples uh, from one GP for different vector fields. Uh, on the background, the gray arrows show the vector field, essentially how the particle or like how the state should move. Um, and these are four independent rows again. And I then compute the integral starting from the uh, origin. So the red dot here is the initial value of the integral. Uh, and then, well, the blue is the OD trajectory. So the message here is that draws from GP, like different draws from GP, they could have completely different dynamics, as shown here, as well as they could have different velocities. Like uh, the plot on the right, the curve is a bit longer. That means the velocity of the vector field is bigger. So GPs are super flexible in that sense. And now what we do is, given some evidence, given some data, um, we essentially compute the posterior estimate of this vector field, of, of this GP. Now here the data looks like this. This is the initial value for the data. This is the second time point, and then goes like this, uh, clockwise. And uh, we have the prior, we have the data, and then we can compute the posterior, and posterior looks like this. And again, on the background is the vector field, and the data, well, again, the blue is the OD trajectory, and OD trajectory seems to fit um, the data pretty well. Now, I'll quickly describe our model more rigorously. So we use uh, sparse GPs to approximate the differential function. So that means we have a bunch of inducing uh, values and inducing vectors. Each circle here denotes one inducing uh, value that we show by Z. And the arrows are the inducing vectors, which we show by u and ui, like, um, maybe I could show it there. So here, this is one inducing point, and the arrow is one inducing value, and we have like a bunch of those in our model. Um, yeah. We then introduce kernel interpolation. So essentially, we say that the value of the differential function, differential function at any point, is given by this equation. Now, this is the GP mean, like conditional GP uh, mean. Um, so in this work, we completely discarded the uncertainty part, which, uh, which really simplifies the model. And we found out that this super simplifying assumption is actually super powerful. So this simple model is able to um, learn lots of different real world and lots of diff different uh, 
real OD dynamics. And now what we do is, well, given some initial value, we compute the integral, and again, match this uh, blue curve against data and um, optimize the system. And what we do is we optimize the inducing locations, z, inducing vector z, uh, and maybe kernel hyperparameters. Um, yeah. And what we do in our OD2 VAE work is to replace this, B, uh, this, this GP with a Bayesian neural net. And again, we optimize the parameters of the Bayesian neural net. So essentially, we change the black box solver. Otherwise, the, well, the idea is pretty much the same. Um, so let's see now the building blocks of um, OD2 VAE. First, to set the stage, now our goal is to learn um, dynamics from high dimensional um, data objects, data sequences, like videos, um, and again, we would like to use ODs to learn the dynamics, and our goal is essentially learn the dynamics so that we can extrapolate, we can predict into future, or if there are missing frames, missing, like, if there are gaps in our sequence, uh, we can fill it once the dynamics are learned pretty accurately. But now, defining an OD system in the data space doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, because the pixels, they don't essentially follow any OD system, they're just pixels. On the other hand, there is this latent uh, dynamic system, which is like the driving of the car is happening, so it can be modeled by an OD. This is why what we do is we have a latent OD model, and the mapping between the latent space and the data space is uh, via a variation autoencoder. Um, and also for scalability purposes, we use uh, Bayesian neural nets instead of GPs again. And usually vanilla sparse GPs, they fail to um, scale dimensions up to 25 or 30, but in case of video modeling, or like modeling this many uh, dimensional sequences, usually uh, like higher dimensional latent spaces are needed very much like 100 or 200 uh, dimensional latent spaces. And also, BNNs or neural nets in general are more scalable in terms of compute power compared to GPs. And then I'll quickly go over all the components of the model, and the first one is a variation autoencoder, which I guess most of you uh, are familiar with. So we use consists of two networks. One is called the encoder network, and the other one is called the decoder. The encoder takes the input, uh, which is usually an image, as input, and then outputs a distribution. This distribution is usually a Gaussian, uh, and here we show the mean and the variance of this latent distribution. And then what the decoder does is decoder samples from the latent distribution, uh, and then tries to reconstruct the original image. So the decoder output should look like the original input as much as possible. Uh, but what the decoder sees is not a single latent set, but rather lots of draws from the latent distribution, essentially. So VAEs are super nice, useful things. Here is one example. If you take the MNIST data set and give it to a VAE, and then um, if you have a two-dimensional latent space, now the latent space looks like this. Um, Essentially, this particular image means that if you give this to the encoder, and then uh, if you, if you uh, plot this image uh, on the mean location that the encoder gives, this is like this location, essentially. And then if you look at this image, there is like some sort of structure in the latent space. There's some sort of manifold on which the latent states uh, are living. Uh, and like ones are here, for example, eights are there. And then if you interpolate between a one and eight, uh, you get some intermediate uh, blurry, like numberish digits, numberish, well, maybe images, uh, which intuitively makes sense. Essentially, you interpolate, and then what you get is something between an eight and, and a one. So you fancier things. If you have a data set of faces, let's say with different characteristics, such as smiling or eyeglasses, having eyeglasses or not, and if you give this to a VAE, uh, and if your VAE is designed in such a way that it disentangles the latent components, which means that it finds a latent embedding where the components are orthogonal to each other, essentially they represent different uh, well, characteristics of the image, then you can do this type of thing. So in the simple example, uh, one latent component, for example, could correspond to like the color of the face, and the other one could be like the shape of the eye, shape of the uh, maybe nose, that kind of stuff. And here, it turns out that one component is essentially smiling and the other one is having glasses or not. And when you draw a sample from the latent space, 
and then you keep all the components the same, except the smile component, and then you linearly interpolate, well, you essentially change the value of the smile component, and what happens is essentially the top row. A guy or a girl starts smiling, because all the components, all the visual aspects are the same, except the smile. And the same for eyeglasses as, well, any other, uh, any other feature you have. And also, VEs can be used to uh, generate uh, chemically sound molecules. Here is uh, another simple example. This is called uh, a chemical VAE, and the paper is from two years ago, but there are like lots of works uh, in the field. And such models usually marry a VAE with a uh, latent feature predictor, and then learn some sort of like more compact representation of the latent space. And then in test mode, what's done is that the latent predictor is reverse engineered so that we can generate molecules with certain desired properties. Uh, so we can indeed uh, learn a latent space that gives us novel and desired uh, molecules. All right, these are great, but there are also downsides of VAEs. And one of them is VAEs are inherently static. So that means if you're a data set, we give it to a VAE and it treats all the data items well, as IID, independent of each other, independent of each other, and then a VE can encode all the items and then decode them almost perfectly, which is great, but then the, day, the latent item, well, the latent distributions or latent samples, they don't talk to each other. So the car is here, like, moving, so the latent, uh, latent distributions or latent samples are kind of correlated or, like, they are somehow linked, uh, but we completely ignore this, and this is why a VE is not able to extrapolate into features. So it cannot tell you what's gonna be the position of the car in the fourth frame, for example. So one idea to make VAEs dynamic is essentially this. So let's say some autoregressive function f in latent, uh, latent space. So what this function does is that it takes one frame, uh, sorry, one, one latent sample, um, and then gives you another latent sample. And then this latent sample, we decode it and match this frame, uh, well, this reconstruction to the second frame that we observe. Uh, and we repeat this for the next uh, time steps. So with this, it is possible, it may be possible to learn a latent function f, and if the function f is accurate enough, then we can extrapolate into features. So people typically use uh, models like RNNs in a latent space, um, and this is like what we'd like to replace. But now one problem with this type of modeling is that um, now let's try to predict the position of the car in the second frame. And the position of the car here is a function of the position in the first frame as well as the velocity of the car, right? And uh, the position information is, well, essentially hidden in this image, in the, in the training image, but then you, do, you have no idea what the velocity could be because velocity is a second order information. And what you need is then a second order model so that you can extract the velocity information and then you can, well, predict the car's position in the next frame. And this is why we use a second order audio system. And our second order audios are defined very much like first order audios. But now on the left hand side we have second time derivative of some state f. And then on the right hand side is again a function f which takes this time the state as input as well as the first derivative and returns us the second derivative. That's the formal definition. Um, now let's introduce one more equation. Let's call the first time derivative of f as v, and now let's call the state variable at t as position and v t the first derivative as velocity. Now if we read the second equation, it goes like the time derivative of position is velocity, which is just high school physics, right? And the first equation goes like the second derivative of position, which is acceleration, is a function of position and velocity. And that also intuitively makes sense. And what we do in our work is to treat f uh, well, f is unknown, and we uh, try to approximate f using a uh, Bayesian neural net. So, Bayesian neural nets are very much like their deterministic versions, where uh, instead of having um, point estimates on the way through, we have a distribution over each and every weight and bias component, and otherwise, it's all the same. Now I will construct, uh, sorry, I will uh, contrast three models, an autoregressive uh, model, a neural audio, and a Bayesian neural audio, so that you can uh, see the differences. Well, 
so here is one training data. Again, this is like the same data that I, sh that I showed you before. That's the first point, and the second point, and then you continue like this. And I'll refer to data as y from time one to time t. Um, now that's what an autoregressive model looks like. Essentially, an autoregressive model says that next state is equal to this state plus some function of this state. And this function f is, again, in our case, a simple neural network with weight w. And then the term that we'd like to optimize the cost function is some likelihood between the data and, uh, and inferred trajectory, inferred discrete trajectory, and we again optimize with respect to the weight. So we learn weights that give, give rise uh, a nice fit. And here the fit is shown by blue. Again, the data is in red. And because it's a discrete system, uh, we have like a bunch of dots here. Um, that's an autoregressive model. So essentially, this is like how RNNs work. And a neural OD is, well, something else. Well, actually, it's quite similar, I would say. Instead of taking those discrete steps, uh, you use an OD solver, where the input to the OD solver is the initial value, like the times where I would like to evaluate the integral and the weights or the differential function itself. And essentially, what the OD solver does is it, it computes the integral at uh, those observed time points and return us, well, essentially returns us a continuous system, a continuous trajectory this time, uh, but the likelihood computed only against the data, which means we like likelihood only involves those integrated time points at the observed uh, time points. And the vector field looks like this. So we believe that uh, so neural ODs or GP-based ODs are new things, but we believe that this is the correct way of doing continuous time modeling instead of this. So like, we do know that all models are wrong, but some of them are more useful, some of them are useful, and we believe that neural ODs or in general uh, black box ODs are less wrong. In that sense, we'd like to use those. And now I show you a Bayesian neural uh, OD. As I said, uh, we have a distribution over the weight here, um, and this distribution is denoted by Q. This is usually a Gaussian. We usually have a mean field approximation, and M and S are the weights, uh, like mean and co mean and variance over the weights. And then what we do is we draw a sample. Uh, we draw a sample from the posterior, approximate posterior, and then we compute the integral, and we repeat this many, many times. Here in this example, I do it 10 times, and I visualize 10 vector fields and 10 trajectories on the background. And then the, um, the cost function this time, sorry, the cost function this time is a bit different. So we, instead of optimizing maximum likelihood, we optimize Eudin's lower bound, or a Monte Carlo approximation of the Eudin lower, lower bound. And now here the first term is essentially, this term is uh, Monte Carlo approximation of the likelihood. So that's pretty much the same as this term. But in addition, we have one more term, a KL term, between the Q distribution that we, 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 that we are inferring and uh, between some prior. So KL essentially penalizes really complex likelihood and re, uh, really complex models. So this is supposed to help against uh, overfitting. And now here, I show you three test sequences this time. One sequence, for example, starts from here. The other one starts from there, and 50 samples from, um, from the OD system. So essentially what we see is that, um, well, maybe there the uncertainty is really small. So there are like few data items, and the blue trajectories, they are really close to each other. They are almost collapsed. But there, for example, the uncertainty is, well, the data is a bit noisy. We add some noise. and this is the reason why we have like some um, uncertainty in this region. And if you draw more samples, all your samples are going to cover um, your sequences. Yeah. Now I'll quickly illustrate the model. Uh, again, the input is a sequence of frames. Here I show you three frames. It's like first, second, and third one. And we see uh, three balls bouncing uh, within a box. This, this is it's called the bouncing ball data set. Um, and again, we have, because we have like a position and uh, velocity components and like an integral for each, uh, we have, we need two encoders. One is for the position, like, yeah, one is for the position and the other one is for the velocity. The position encoder takes only the initial frame. 
So here the underlying assumption is that uh, the initial frame contains all the position information. And the velocity encoder takes here three frames, but it should take at least two frames uh, because velocity is secondary information. And in case your data is uh, noisy, then having like more than three inputs to the velocity encoder makes sense. Next, uh, we draw samples from our encoders, which is what's typically done in, in VAE. Now, these points are going to be the initial values for our ODE integration. And now we integrate them forward. Here, the position and velocity trajectories, they follow the acceleration field, the function that you'd like to infer again. And essentially what we do is we take the initial value, we sample from the encoders, we sample from the approximate posterior, uh, give those to the ODE solver, and ODE solver returns us those trajectories. That's great. And then what we do is we then decode at the observed time points and then say that uh, now there's a first reconstruction and then we match this against the first data item here and the same for the second ones. And we can extrapolate into future as much as uh, we want because, well, we have a continuous time system essentially. Um, and the inference is done so that we learn the encoder, decoder, and acceleration field all together through backpropagation. So the error starts backpropagate, sorry, starts backpropagating all the way from here through the decoder, through the OD field, and through the encoder. So there are lots of steps uh, in the backpropagation, but uh, it works. And one thing to note is that here our assumption was that like a single image contains all the velocity, uh, all the position information. And what we do while decoding is to ignore the velocity component of the latent state, but only give the position, uh, position component to the decoder. So the decoder only sees the position uh, and outputs some image that we match against uh, the data trajectory. And we also tried giving both position and velocity as input to the decoder, but then this kind of screw things up or training becomes like more troublesome. And here is one slide of inference. Uh, we first combine uh, the position and velocity components and call them Z. And then we have this um, huge variation of the posterior uh, where we have a distribution, well, here it, it decomposes like this, where we have a distribution over the weight. And then we have a distribution due to the, well, encoding. And we have one more distribution induced by the OD integration. Um, so everything here is sampling based. So we sample from the encoder, sample from the OD distribution and the weights as well. And at the end of the day, the evidence lower bound terms, ter uh, term becomes this, where we have three uh, penalty terms, three KL terms that penalizes all those variational distributions. Plus we have reconstructions, reconstruction terms or expect, well, or yeah, expect likelihood. Uh, so we get nice good reconstructions because of this and then we get um, protection against overfitting thanks to uh, those KL terms. Now let's see what the experiments look like. So I have three sets of experiments. Um, one is on motion capture data set. Um, essentially, a bunch of people are walking and their bodies, like the sensors are attached all around their bodies and then we collect 50 different sensor measurements. Um, this is a small but real data set. So there are 12 sequences uh, of length 300. And I have three test sequences. And a rotating MNIST is just MNIST data sets where the digits are rotated. And the bouncing balls is our large scale experiment where as I showed you before, there are three balls bouncing within a box. They are like hitting each other as well as like bouncing off the walls. And we have half a million frames. So rotating MNIST and bouncing balls we have uh, convolutional neural nets as the encoders and decoders. And in mocap data, we have just uh, fully connected layers. And differential function is always fully connected layers. And now one thing to note is that uh, the way that we report, well, the way that we test our model is that we take only the first three frames or three um, sensor readings, and then we try to extrapolate into future like as much as uh, we want. And this is unlike how people report in RNN world, uh, how, we, how people report the errors in RNN world. So what people do is typically they take 
let's say the th three frames is input and then the output next frame and then they assume that like the correct, correct frame, like original test frame comes after this prediction step and then they like slide their window a bit and again take the first, again, again take the three frames and then predict the next one. So this type of like one step rate prediction fails to generate like reasonable let's say sequences after let's say five or 10 frames. But unlike this, what we're interested in again, uh, like good long-term forecast. And like if you're a video sequence of like let's say frame rate, frame rate 24, that means you have 24 frames a second, like predicting one step, like one frame into future doesn't make a lot of sense. So here is the first set of results where we compared uh, our model, like two versions, uh, where like the second version contains one KL term, which I'm gonna explain later on. So we compared two versions of our model against uh, four GP-based models and against neural OD. And again, this is a small data set, and the data set one is particularly smaller than data set two. And now what we see is that neural OD, um, like the error of neural OD in the first data set on the smaller data set is pretty big but our model does a fairly good job. And we believe this, this is because of regularization. Essentially, we have a bunch of like KL terms that I showed you, and these help against uh, overfitting, as I said. Uh, yeah. And then here I show you three, sorry, here I show you a sequence where on the left, I show you the latent integration. It's, a, it's in 3D, and on the right is the reconstruction. Um, now here, the red sequence is the true test sequence and the blue sequence is the reconstruction again. And we take only the first, here I show you 300 frames, and we take only the first three frames of the red guy, give it as input to the encoder, and then encoder gives us initial values, which is like the dot here, and then we compute the integral. And the integral, like this, this plot kind of makes sense because walking is a cyclic motion, right? And our latent trajectory is also looping, so latent trajectory somehow reflects the real dynamics, like this is how we conclude. Um, well, you can sample more from your latent distributions, from your encoder or from your differential function. Here I show you three samples, and you could draw even more samples here, I show you 50. So latent space is super chaotic, but what you see is that all the latent guys somehow match uh, the test sequence, so they're not superly like perfectly aligned, but at least like body configurations are uh, almost perfect, I would say, and sufficiently close to the test data. And again, this is a um, 300 step ahead prediction, although the problem is a bit simpler. Now I'll show you second set of results on bouncing ball, where we compared our second order model against the first order version of it. In OD1, we, we have just first order OD system, and the latent dimensionality in OD2 is 25 plus 25. And in OD1 we we try 25 and 50. And on the right uh, are the test mean squared errors where we see that OD2 VA is superior uh, to the first order um, cousins. And we also see that having a Bayesian neural network instead of a deterministic neural network is not so bad. So the error is pretty much the same. Um, so essentially when we have like large data, BNS converge to like in terms of performance, they converge to neural nets and, well, that's pretty good. And then these are rotating three sequences. On top I show you a training sequence with some gaps, and on the bottom are a few reconstructions. So, well, rotating n digits is pretty simple. And then here's the bouncing ball example. On top is a test sequence of 40 frames. And on the bottom is our predictions where we again take the only first, like the only three frames as input, and then our model is able to predict like 20 frames into future like pretty well, and we got the state of the art results on that, but then the model kind of screws things up and results in this kind of blurry reconstruction. We believe that this is mostly because, uh, well, as we integrate more into future, we accumulate the error. So our differential function, encoder, decoder, none of them are perfect and the essentially integral, like the error in the, in the differential function, for, for example, well, accumulates like over time, and then we get uh, these type of, well, blurry uh, images at the end. 
probably are just uh, all about the work, but then there are many interesting directions where this work uh, can be extended. First, if you, uh, if you follow, we have two different uh, latent distributions, one through the ODE integration and one through the encoder. So these two latent distributions, they are not necessarily aligned. They are not necessarily the same. And this, uh, we have, if you remember, there was one row of results where I, I wrote OD to VAE KL. So we had this KL, extra KL term that uh, matches the encoder distribution and OD distribution. So this definitely helps performance, inc helps increasing the performance. On the other hand, this is kind of an ad hoc solution that we, uh, that we would like to change with a uh, more principled way of while well, writing down variation movements. So division of labor, uh, we found out that if you have a perfect decoder, if you have like a giant decoder, then your differential function essentially learns nothing. So it learns to draw just simple curve, and then uh, the decoder overfits to this curve and then gives you perfect reconstructions. But what we're interested in is to learn the dynamics, well, as well as we can. This is why we use the medium-sized decoder in our experiments, but this also is like not the best solution, I would say. So we'd like to replace this, if possible, into feature. And our model is an ODE model, so we can only learn uh, differentiable dynamics, but uh, this model could also be extended to stochastic versions of differential equations, well, stochastic differential equations. Now here I show you a plot from, uh, well, extending uh, ODEs, like black box ODEs to SDEs was already done in the context of um, GP-based neural network, uh, GP-based OD systems, and uh, like people from out of Pashu, Marcus, um, Sami, and Harry, they did, like they published this work already. What they do is um, essentially here on the right is one old, well, set of OD trajectories where this is the initial value and the trajectory follows the vector field. And in case of an SDE, we have this thing called Brownian motion that perturbs the trajectory a bit. So here is the same initial value and when you integrate, you have a bunch of end values. So the trajectory is, not, is no longer deterministic, it's stochastic, and uh, this also helps against overfitting. And this model was developed in the context of classification, so essentially they use uh, all those endpoints to classify, well, certain data items, and this again uh, increases the performance. Now, as I showed you before, there are some blurry reconstructions in our model, and it's pretty well known that we reconstructions are usually blurry, they are not perfect, whereas GANs are great at generating like super sharp images. So maybe it could be possible to merge these two uh, models where we have a VAE GAN uh, hybrid model uh, that hopefully results in uh, like perfect, uh, perfectly sharp reconstructions. But of course, VAE GAN models have already been proposed. And what people typically do, this is like one of the first uh, works in this line of research. So they use a VAE here uh, as the generative part of the GAN, and then they have discriminator, which essentially says, uh, the, which essentially compares the VAE output here, X tilde, against the true, uh, true input to the VAE, and then it discriminates. And the loss is somehow like a combination of the autoencoder loss and the GAN loss and the loss increase, well, sorry, the loss decreases uh, if you have perfectly sharp reconstructions. So that's the story. But this work is from like four years ago, and there are lots of like more impressive, more like fancier work in this direction. Um, yeah. So I told you that we have a variation distribution over the weights of our BNN, right? Uh, so that's not the only way of uh, doing Bayesian, well, using Bayesian neural nets. So there are these things called functional or function space BNNs where instead of having priors on the weights, which we did, and which is called a weight space uh, BNN, people have, people have BNNs whose outputs are distributions, and then they have a prior on the output of the, uh, on the, output of the BNN, essentially. If you have such a model, now here the first row is like, here, the red dots are a bunch of data points and the blues are the fit. And on top, you see a Bayesian neural net, like a weight space, and here's a functional uh, Bayesian neural net. And essentially what happens in a functional BNN is that the uncertainty around the data items uh, is pretty small, but out of data region, the uncertainty is high. And this, this looks pretty much like uh, GPs and looks nice, I would say. 
Uh, and finally, in case of rotating emits, for example, or like in case of bouncing balls, we have all the latent states evolving over time, but we do know that like the shapes of the balls or the colors, they don't evolve over time. So these are essentially static features. So can we have a latent space where we decompose the static features from the dynamic ones? So this type of disentanglement is also studied uh, in the VA literature where, well, this was, I guess, Beta VA paper was one of the first in this line of research where they essentially have a chair generating VAE <laughs> where like one of the components that they identify corresponds to angles, one of them is the width of the chairs, and one of them is the leg style. So we can use those type of disentangling uh, VAEs in our, well, model, maybe. Um, yeah, that's all I, I have to say, and the paper is online, the code is online, and there are like two versions of the code. One is pretty simple to read, you'll see the uh, repo if you look at it, and these are the references. Uh, so my, my room is that way in this building, feel free to like drop by and send like any email if you have any questions, and thanks for your attention. So in order to do that, uh, do we need some special constraints in the models, like the input state of the VAs, like some components yeah. representing different parts of mm -hmm. I would say that what people typically do is that they don't modify the encoders or decoders, but rather they have, for example, they could have, like people have hierarchies of a uh, like bunch of encoders, which, which are like in a, in a you know, like hierarchical way. So that like each output of the uh, encoder is essentially like forms like a bunch of layers, they put it that way, and then each layer learns something different. And then those like different layers could be manipulated in test mode, and then this is like one way of doing that. And again, the disentanglement or like latent manipulation of the input, uh, this is like what people typically do. So instead of doing it, doing, instead of manipulating the encoder itself or the decoder itself, people are more interested in doing these type of latent manipulations, I would say. Yeah. Um, what kind of applications do you think are possible outside of computer vision? Well, I would definitely say uh, like molecular biology applications. So again, you measure like lots of, let's say, some sort of like mRNA measurements, and then you would like to see what's gonna be the next state of the cell. And if you believe that this is governed by an OD system, then you could use this model, for example. And this is like what we are trying at the moment. And um, again, this model can be used in the context of classification, where the OD is used as a flow, like a normalizing flow, where you have like more complicated um, densities, more complicated variation approximations. And on top of that, now we're working on like reinforcement learning version of this work, where uh, we have like some extra controlled inputs um, to the OD system so that we can essentially uh, control the system. And yeah, like all these are super flexible, like, like the framework is super flexible and like there are like many different directions to try, I would say. I mean, if the system is always in, well, steady state, if nothing is changing abruptly or nothing is changing at all, then like essentially you have like a constant curve, I would say, and doing modeling in that type of data, like doing at least OD modeling in that, that type of data could be a bit tricky, I would say. I can't think of like 
the solution, but like the problems that we tackle are usually like highly dynamic, so the features they uh, always change over time. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, because in your service, some of your biochemical system you are mentioned in earlier, uh, yeah. often the measurement apply, assuming that the system is steady state, often because this is the most common way to measure the system. So, so in that case, I'm really concerned about the accuracy of, of the neural OED when you apply for the system, infer the parameters. Thank you so much.